In March 2014, I nearly died. I hiked up to the temple atop Mount Omine, one of the most sacred mountains in Nara, to pray for the healthy birth of my second daughter. On my descent, I slipped and fell in the deep snow. Far from the trail, I became lost. I survived in the mountains for seven days. Miraculously, on the seventh day, I clawed my way back up to the snowy peak and found a path down to the village where my pregnant wife and three-year-old daughter were waiting. So I'm really happy to be participating in this Teacher's Journey conference. And the reason I wanted to participate was because I have a story to tell. And it starts out pretty dramatic with me being in the mountains and nearly losing my life. But obviously I'm uh, here today. And so I wanted to share my story for a couple of reasons. One, I survived and I learned a lot of things from that experience about life, about my purpose, you know, what, it, what is the meaning of even being here? And secondly, it's really helped me to become a better teacher. So I've used this experience to help me get to know my students, to bond with them and to motivate them. And I would really like to, first of all, share my story with you because I think it's a pretty great story. But secondly, show you how this story has helped me become a better teacher. And hopefully, uh, if you're watching this, maybe you can uh, pick up something and it might help you along your teacher's path as well. Um, not only for teachers, but for everyone. Um, I just want to say, when you face death, when you get that close, it might be cliche, but it's, it makes you really think about what life means. And, you know, sometimes we go through our day to day and we feel tired, exhausted. We don't know what we're doing. We feel fed up, frustrated, and especially um, in the current times with the pandemic. But after having that experience, it's like every day is meaningful. Just being here is a special thing. And I hope after watching this video, you can feel that. And when you go back into your classrooms or wherever you go, uh, you'll feel a little bit more excited and able to appreciate just being here because just being alive is already uh, meaning in itself. So uh, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so what happened? Well, back in March 2014, uh, I came to this village, Dorogawa, and your mom was pregnant with Margie, eight months pregnant with Margie, and I came here to go to the top of Mount Omine, uh, which is in the distance from here. And there's a temple at the top, and I went up there to pray for her healthy birth. I did the same thing for you when you were in your mother's tummy. And everything was great. The weather was really nice that day. I went up to the top and I prayed. I stood at the temple and I was feeling really good about the start of our new family, which was going to be four people. And then as I was coming down the mountain, I have to mention there was a lot of snow that day because it was March. Uh, there was a couple of meters in the, in the mountains and I came to a spot where there was a kind of wooden staircase and it was broken. And so I had taken this trail a couple of times before and knew there was one more path to the right. And so I thought, okay, I better avoid this broken stairs. And I went a little bit to the right and I was walking. And at that point I slipped and started falling down the mountain. And I got to this point where I was just hanging there. So I fell about 70 meters or so. And I was just hanging there. And looking back up where I came from and hoping I could get back up. And at that moment, I slipped and fell again. And this time I really tumbled down the mountain. And at that moment, I thought it was all over. 
but luckily I somehow came to a stop and kind of tumbled into this little mountain stream. And I looked up and I thought there's no way back up for me. So there's a stream here. If I've worked my way down, it's got to lead down to the village or a nearby village. So I started working my way down this frozen stream little by little by little. And after a long time making a lot of progress, I thought I came to a point and there was a sudden drop off. It was this waterfall. I almost kind of went over the edge and my heart started beating really hard because now I knew I couldn't go down that way. You didn't have any rope? I didn't have anything like that. I just had, you know, my clothes that I was wearing. But, I mean, I just planned to go up the mountain, pray for Margie's birth, come back down and, you know, go to the hot spring and then take it easy. But so now I'm at that waterfall and there's nowhere to go. And I'm starting to panic a little bit because I knew I couldn't get up. I know I couldn't get down. I backtrack up to this little spot. It's almost like a little hill in the mountains. And I stand there and I say, just gather your thoughts. I started taking off my wet clothes and started looking around and, and surveying the ground and thinking, okay, I had this small Ziploc bag of almonds. I have a little bit of food and a little bit of uh, dates were in there. And that's about it. So I thought I got, I got some food. I better hold on to that. And I start turning in a circle, like a 360 degrees, looking and looking and looking. And Daddy, as you know, has bad eyesight. But I look down into the trees, probably, let's say, 100 meters down. And I see something that resembles like a house, a cabin or something. And my heart starts beating a little faster, like, oh, wait, maybe somebody's in there. And I mean, it's crazy to think because this is the middle of nowhere and deep in the mountains. And as I get a little bit closer, I realize this is some broken down shelter. And there's nobody there. But I thought at least I have some some place to, to get some shelter. So I climbed through this broken window and I sat there and then I told myself, just get through this night. Just make it through this night. Don't fall asleep. The cold was coming. It was windy. And I said, just get through this night. And I just sat there and tried to keep warm as I could and made it through the night. Um, as you know, I ended up spending six nights out in the mountains. And there was a rescue squad, squad that came um, from the volunteer firefighters, the police, uh, they even had some dogs. Daddy, stop saying orange. They had, <laughs> they had uh, helicopters yeah. looking for me. So, you know, my thought while I was out there was, well, I should be, I was expected back by mommy in a couple of days. And until then, I just got to figure my way out if I can. I couldn't. There was just no way out. And I just had to survive. And as you know, later on, Mommy filed a missing persons report. And they set up this team at the police and the local fire brigade. And they all came searching around the town and in the mountains. And I even saw the helicopter. It actually flew right over my head. I stood there. I was waving like, help, Daddy, right here. help. And I was waving and waving and the helicopter flew right over my head and it didn't see me. But I had this like burst of optimism. Like they, I know someone's searching for me. They got to come back and. Um, Couldn't you light a fire? I didn't have any fire with me, so. Well, I mean, you don't need matches to light a fire. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess if I, if I had that, that talent, I would have had a fire, but I didn't. And um, the helicopters flew over, but then the day started passing and they didn't come back. And it became night. And this was now day five. And then day six came and I mean, I still felt like people are searching. So I was trying to stay visible and um, I, little by little, I started going up the mountain a little bit, trying to find an even more open spot where they might see me. And 
I started making some progress actually. There was all these trees and I started grabbing the trees to hold on to to help me up and when I held the tree it was I just felt like the tree was trying to help me. It was the support that you know is no longer just me that we were working together and I was feeling really good and I You're got to crazy. and then I got to this point and I thought maybe I might be able to get back up if I can keep going. It wasn't the way that I came, but if I keep going, maybe I can back, get back up to a trail. And then just as I was thinking that, I got to this point and I slipped and I really felt this time. I was like, I was tumbling down the mountain like a basketball and there was all these rocks and trees and I really thought this is the end. And, you know, I had this feeling like, I don't even have time to like think about my family and remember all the good times. It just was happening so fast. And I thought that was the end. And then suddenly I, my foot hit something and I kind of fell and I slowed down in the snow and I kind of checked everything and I was still alive. And I was like, oh, that was such a close call. I should just go back to the shelter. I shouldn't be moving around. And I went back to the shelter and just waited. But this, by this point, the clouds cover, were covering the skies and it started to rain a little bit. And I knew they'd probably call off the rescue. It's, I mean, it's already day six. So I was sitting there in the shelter on the last night. And to be honest, I was kind of... This selfie saved your life, probably. Yeah, I definitely think so. Were your almond and dates going by then? I would, I would eat like one almond. It would be like, that would be a meal. And I'd just chew on it and try to eat that to get some some energy. And um, yeah, they were pretty much everything was gone. And then I was sitting there kind of feeling like, I can't believe this is it. Like this just didn't seem right to me. This is the end of my life. And here back in Osaka, my pregnant wife and my three-year-old daughter, and, and you, I mean, before this moment, me and you were just best buddies constantly together. And I was just, I couldn't believe, not only that I wouldn't get to see you again, but I was, what I was really worried about was you know, time would pass, time would pass, and then you wouldn't even remember me. And when I thought about that, I just thought, man, this is... So, what about Margie, though? And, you know, we didn't hadn't even met Margie yet. I mean, she was still in Mommy's tummy. I wouldn't even get to meet our second child. And I was sitting there kind of feeling like giving up. I didn't know what else I could do. And at that moment, I mean, I can't explain it, but you appeared in front of me, three-year-old you. And you said, Daddy. Was it my whole body or just my head? It was your whole body. You were just right in front of me and you said, Daddy, Daddy don't give up. Go off the mountain. And I said, I mean, I've, I've tried, but all right. I'll, I mean, I'll do whatever I can do. I'll go as hard as I can, as far as I can until I die, if that happens. But I'll do whatever I can. So I waited until the next morning. And the weather just got worse and worse unbelievable rain and wind but i said i gotta go i mean i can't i can't stay here forever and so i just little by little i started crawling my way up that frozen river and back up the mountain little by little and then finally i got to this point and i saw something that looked like like a viewpoint of some sort there was like a little wooden deck and i couldn't believe it like that's got to be something up in the mountain and I climbed over it and I just kind of fell down and laid there. I was like, the trail has got to be close to here. Uh, worked my way through the snow for a while and I came to where the temple was actually. And I thought maybe I should just wait here until the next morning. Hopefully the weather will be better because it would be dangerous to keep moving. But I just, something told me, maybe my instincts or something told me I got to go. And, Finally, I work, started working my way down the mountain and I ended up getting to the trail, back to where those broken steps were. And I took my time and instead of going right, I went left this time. And I found a trail, worked my way down the mountain and I got back to the village. And little by little, I walked for a while and I came to the first house I could see, which happened to be someone I knew uh, Shin Choku Sensei, and I rang the bell and said, help, help, this is Michael. 
They opened the door, they couldn't believe it. I mean, someone must have contacted them to tell them that I was missing. I fell in the entrance and they picked me up and they carried me into the bathroom and they have one of those communal baths, one of those big baths. And they stripped off my clothes and these four men carried me and sent me into the bath. And they were worried I was going to, my frostbitten hands were going to get injured in the really hot water. So they actually held those out of the water in these little lukewarm uh, basins. And there we are, all completely naked, as you know, you go into the hot spring. And I hadn't said a word, I was just in shock. And then it hit me, like, this is like humanity. These people, I don't even really know these people. And they're helping me, and I just started crying like I never cried before in my life. It was like like a cry you hear from a baby. Um, and I just was so, it was like, I kind of understood everything at that moment. And then they brought, they helped me get my clothes back on, and a policeman came and brought me to the hotel. And there I was reunited with you and mommy, and I hugged you guys. And I mean, you saw daddy was crying. There's a picture where you're kind of holding, patting me on the shoulder like, daddy, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And me and mommy are embracing and crying. And, and then me and mommy stood there. And it was the craziest thing because your mom held me and she said to me, and I hadn't even spoken yet, I was just still speechless, which is surprising, right? Because daddy is never speechless. I'm always talking. And she grabbed me and said, I knew you would never give up. I knew you would get back to your family. I knew you were a great man. I knew how much you love us. And the thing about it was, these were the things I was actually saying in the mountains. In fact, I would stand there and I would shout it out, I won't give up. I will get back to my family. And then they put us in the ambulance. Um, you stayed with grandma. And we went to the hospital and mommy was with me and we just had this great talk. And, and you know what I realized from all that experience, I already figured it out was, you know, my life had a purpose and I wasn't, it wasn't my time to go. I had something to do. And I really felt the meaning of my life was to be with my family. Um, yeah. So do you remember that time at all? Uh, I remember not, you, you, grew up, you wouldn't let me stay. In, oh, in the hospital. that's right. And then I was in the hospital for a week uh, recovering. Okay, so now you've seen the part of my uh, mountain survival, you've heard that story, and now I'd like to talk about some of the lessons that I learned. Now, the first lesson I learned was, it's good to have fire. Okay, never mind that. Of course it's good to have fire. I didn't have fire, but let's get to the real uh, lessons here. Number one, gratitude for life. Um, it's already a miracle just to be alive, and once I was in the position that I was maybe not going to make it, the one thing that I desired was to, to be alive and, and get back to, to my family and, and to continue my life. And so just to be alive is an incredible thing. And so don't take that for granted. Um, number two, uh, overcoming challenges and uh, perseverance. Um, life would not be interesting without challenges. Um, when we're faced with challenges, sometimes we struggle and we feel stress and it's hard. But life would not be interesting. It would be static and, and maybe even boring without challenges. Um, and so I learned from this experience, overcoming uh, big challenges um, make life uh, what it is, as uh, special as it is. Um, but not only big challenges, any challenges that you might be faced with, um, and I'm sure we, we all have them in our day-to-day -day life, 
uh, perseverance. Uh, don't give up. Um, sometimes you feel tired or, or, or out of it. And, and what I want to say is just don't give up. And the, the feeling of overcoming a challenge, even a little one, is a great feeling. Uh, finally, uh, we are all one and not alone. Um, as you probably guessed from this video, I like to, to talk and um, I love being around people and so being alone is not really my cup of tea. Um, but even out in the mountains, even though I was physically alone, I didn't feel alone. I, I felt something more than that, that kind of what I really learned is that we are all one. Um, that includes my family who is, who is looking for me, uh, my friends, um, the trees around me, the mountain, the birds, all of that, we're all one, we're all together, and we aren't alone, um, even though sometimes we may feel that we're not. And um, you know, that's a really good lesson in life. Okay, so from these experiences, I want to be able to apply it to my classes, and you know, I, I feel like I've done that successfully, and that really starts with storytelling. Whenever I bring up this a story in class, the, the class gets excited and, and they, they kind of can't believe it. Um, but storytelling is, is part of being human. We all tell stories. We've heard stories our whole lives. Uh, they go back forever. And that's really about sharing experience so that others can learn from that experience. But one thing I noticed, um, it also humanizes the teacher. Uh, sometimes it may feel that we're, we're separate, that the students are one thing, the teachers are the other thing. But I don't like to feel that way. I want to feel um, uh, part of a team. And when I start to share some of these stories, especially this one, um, I start to see the students looking at me in a different light. Not just their teacher, but a fellow human being. And I think that's a really valuable thing. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about one specific uh, lesson plan that I was able to come up with based on some of these uh, storytelling um, ideas. Um, it's, it's not a new idea per se, but it's uh, something that you could use in your classroom. Um, I think many uh, teachers are familiar with the two truths and a lie uh, activity, and I love this one. Um, why? Because it's about storytelling. So oftentimes when I uh, start with my classes in the beginning of the year, I might do this as an introduction. Um, rather than just a standard, hello, my name is Michael, um, I prefer to tell some stories. And so I will tell three stories and have the students try to guess which one of those three is, is false. And I always include this a mountain uh, story. Um, I try to make the other two stories uh, great as well, but I of course include the mountain story. And when I ask them to vote which story they believe is the lie, 99% of the time they, they choose my mountain story. They just can't believe it. And so when I reveal that that's really my experience, they're all like, huh, really? They can't believe it. And then all these questions start coming and um, you know, it's a great atmosphere in the, in the classroom. And I usually don't say much. I'm just like, and that's it, let's move on. And so they're like, wait, you can't stop here. And I kind of leave a cliffhanger. Um, and then sometimes pick up that theme in, in other classes. But after sharing this story, they're really excited, and then I ask them to uh, come up with uh, three stories of their own. Now, I don't expect the same level as, as I'm uh, coming up with, but um, I give them class time, usually the rest of that class, to prepare their stories. And then I say at the beginning of the next class, you are going to be uh, put with a partner or in a small group and share your stories. And um, you know, they look a little apprehensive at first, but they really get into it. And then at the next class, they share their stories, and I kind of walk around and listen to some of them and participate. And the stories are great. And um, it's great because they get to know each other, and I get to know them. And as I mentioned, it really humanizes each other, that we're all storytellers, um, we're all humans. Um, but I don't stop there. And this is where you can go a step further. So this could be, rather than just one lesson, um, this could be multiple lessons uh, d depending on uh, the class. Um, and so um, in certain classes I'll get into storytelling in itself and how that's a really valuable skill. Um, and so rather than uh, just doing it as an activity, they can carry these stories throughout their lives because as I mentioned, that's what life is about, storytelling. So what I'll often do is have them practice the stories because really um, to make a good story, you need to practice. Um, and so uh, in the class, we'll do practice, we'll do rehearsals, 
and then I'll give them a chance to try to share this story in front of the, the whole class. And again, there's some uh, nerve wracking moments, but um, they usually feel really good afterwards, um, especially since they practiced. And when the reaction of the audience is, is great, um, makes them feel good. So there's a challenge there in doing it, but once they get good at it, um, they really enjoy it. And the, the point I make, the most important point is that they can use these stories throughout their lives and they'll be valuable. So by practicing now, keep that story and that way when you meet someone new, for example, if some of these students uh, travel overseas um, and study or work in an in English speaking environment, they have that story prepared so that when they meet people, they have something interesting to say right away. And um, it'll help with making friends, um, might even help in an interview. Um, but it's also just really good uh, practice in, in communication. So um, basically you start with a two truths and a lie, which is a great kind of icebreaker at the beginning of a semester. But you could also make that into um, uh, a project in itself as a storytelling a theme project um, throughout a semester. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to say about that, um, that's a very specific lesson. Another lesson um, I might use is a survival, survival scenario, much like I faced myself. And I put them in a position where they, um, I give them the conditions. It could be like a snowy mountain, like what I was in. And I give them a certain amount of items. And then in a small group, uh, they're going to discuss um, uh, what kind of items would be most uh, important for their survival. So you could do survival themed uh, activities. Um, and let me get to the last uh, part. This is uh, beyond the lesson, but um, the motivation of the students. And what I realized is by sharing these personal stories, um, especially about uh, my survival experience, I open up to the students and I get to know them and they get to know me and they are they, they feel more motivated to participate in the class because they see me as one of them and they also notice now that i've heard some of their stories that i'm paying attention to them too um, i always want to feel them to feel that they're part of the class that i i, I notice them and by doing these activities um, i've noticed their motivation increase and they tend to put more into the class throughout it, uh, the semester and eventually um, what I really tell them is that I'm the coach and they're the team and I'm cheering for them and I will the whole year. And by doing so, uh, rather than them feeling that I'm just a teacher and they're the students, we're all together in this, that we can all uh, overcome these uh, challenges in the class and succeed. So in the end, um, I think storytelling is a fabulous thing for classes. And if you have a story to tell, um, I recommend sharing it with your students. It may be a great way to have a lesson or even really motivate them. So I hope that this video could also be an inspiration to anybody who watches and help you along your journey. Thanks a lot.